Welcome back to Mortuary Mayhem, a podcast by funeral service professionals for funeral service professionals, where any day above ground is a good one. This month, we're bringing to you a excerpt from the Cape Cod Community College's Funeral Service Lecture Series. The link to the YouTube video for the corresponding slides can be found on our mortuarymayhem.com website. I hope you enjoy. Today, we're going to examine how we can be better funeral directors while working with the healthcare community as we dive into completing the medical section of the death certificate. Greetings. My name is Dan Shea. I'm a retired emergency physician, and I'm here today with your professor, who just happens to have the same name. And we're going to talk about everyone's favorite topic, the death certificate. We'll be speaking about the content, in other words, what information do you need to provide on the death certificate, how to properly complete it, and we'll also talk about some errors, inaccuracies, and some other issues with getting the death certificate completed. Now first, let's talk about where death occurs. Well, anywhere, of course. But where are the common places that uh, you see this? And one, of course, is the hospital, either as an inpatient, or in the emergency department, also in skilled nursing facilities. This could be a nursing home, long-term care facility, rehab facility, or as an outpatient in a surgery center, a clinic, an urgent care center, a private office. It can also occur at home, okay? Now, this can be an expected death, uh, someone on hospice care, uh, or even if they're not on hospice care, someone, let's say, with advanced cancer and the death is expected and they want to uh, die at home. Or it can be an unexpected death where someone suddenly collapses, or in some cases where someone is found uh, expired uh, in their home. It can occur on a job site. This could be an accident, trauma. It could also be someone who has, let's say, a heart attack at the job site. Or it can be out and about, out on the street. Somebody's walking down the sidewalk, someone's walking through the woods on a path, and they suddenly uh, collapse and are later uh, discovered, hopefully sooner rather than later. But in any case, where are you going to be uh, involved? Well, certainly in the hospital. If someone dies in the hospital or in the emergency department, you'll be picking up their remains from the hospital morgue. Skilled nursing facility, uh, you'll also be visiting there. Now, if it's an expected death, someone on hospice, you'll be picking them up from the skilled nursing facility. On the other hand, if it's an unexpected death, someone suddenly uh, develops an, uh, a, a serious problem, they're going to be transported to the hospital, so you'll actually be picking them up there. Outpatient, you'll basically never be picking someone up uh, there or uh, at the job site. Why? Because these, these people will all be transported to the emergency department. The first thing anyone is going to do is call 911. Off they go to the emergency department, and you'll be seeing them at the hospital uh, later. And pretty much the same thing with out and about. Uh, if someone collapses on the sidewalk, etc., they're going to be transported to the hospital unless, let's say, someone's remains are found uh, in the woods. Uh, they've obviously been dead for a while. This then becomes a medical examiner case. All right. Now, who can pronounce death? In all 50 states, physicians pronounce death. Now, in many states, but not all, nurse practitioners and physician assistants can also pronounce patients and certify their death. In many states, but again, not all, even, even fewer uh, states, a nurse is able to pronounce a patient. Now, this is only in very specific settings, and these settings, such as a nursing home, has to have a policy in this regard. But let's say it's an expected death, someone on hospice care, uh, whether they die in the nursing home or uh, at home, uh, a nurse can then pronounce them in the sense that the nurse determines that they are dead and determines a time of death, but a physician must then fill out the death certificate and certify the death. Now, EMS, paramedics and EMTs are not really able to pronounce death, but there are some cases where they can determine that the patient is dead and not transport. This would be someone with no pulses 
who has some other signs of irreversible death, such as rigor mortis, dependent lividity, which you see in the picture here, decapitation, transection, where someone's body is cut in half, or decomposition. In these cases, they determine death, they get medical control from a physician, usually over the radio, who then agrees with their assessment, and rather than transporting the patient to the hospital for care, they are transported, in many cases, directly to the medical examiner's office or to the morgue. What are the criteria for pronouncing death? How do we decide that someone is dead? Well, in the vast majority of cases, we just use clinical criteria, very basic. The patient is unresponsive to stimuli. What does that mean? Well, there's a number of different things you can do. You could just take a cotton ball and rub it on their eyelashes. Very, very sensitive. You're going to see some movement uh, if the patient is still alive. Uh, you can also just press on their fingernail or their toenail. Uh, you can do a little rubbing on their sternum. You really don't have to do anything more aggressive than that. Generally, you're going to get some kind of a response if the patient is uh, not uh, dead. Also, their pupils are fixed and dilated. So you look at their pupils, they're dilated, they're large. In other words, you shine a bright light in and there is no movement. Normally, the pupils should constrict, but there is absolutely no movement. They also have no pulse, no respirations. And when you listen with a stethoscope, which is auscultation, uh, they have no heartbeat or lung sounds. Now, what else can we do? Usually this is enough, especially if it's an expected death, let's say someone in the hospital with cancer or on hospice. Usually this is uh, all you really need to pronounce death. Now, if the patient is in the emergency department or in the ICU, they're going to be on a cardiac monitor. You can either wheel in a machine and get a 12 lead EKG, or you have them on the monitor. As you see here, uh, this is a normal heartbeat. Usually before death, they're going to have some severely abnormal heartbeats. But then uh, when they do expire, you see a systole, which is on the bottom right. Now notice that it's not a flat line, even though we call it flat line. It's not a flat line like you would draw with a ruler. There's a little bit of variation there, but this is basically flat line. By the way, asystole, when you put the word, or I should say, when you put the letter A in front of any word, it means none or without. Systole refers to the beating of the heart, the squeezing down of the heart muscle. So it basically means without beating, or really in this case, without electrical activity, because that's what the EKG uh, is measuring. Something else we can do now, uh, probably about 15 or 20 years ago, we started using bedside ultrasound in the emergency departments and in the ICU, and sometimes other places in the hospital. So nowadays, most emergency departments are going to have at least one, if not more than one, a bedside ultrasound machine, which looks somewhat like a laptop on wheels with some probes attached. And what you do is you bring this into the bedside, you place the probe on the patient's chest. It's actually very easy to see the heart. And it looks like the uh, picture on the left where you see the right and left ventricles, the left atrium, and then the outflow tract, which is the, the beginning of the aorta. Now, that part doesn't really matter. The important part here is that you see the heart beating. What you see in that picture there, you'd actually see movement. You would see it beating if the patient was still alive. And you can actually see a little blood flow uh, growing through as well. On the other hand, if the patient is dead, it looks like the still picture. There's no movement, or there might be a little bit of quivering, but there's no organized uh, movement. And we do this all the time now in the emergency department, pretty much for every cardiac arrest. Uh, there are other things you can do. Um, these are rarely uh, needed, but this would be, let's say you have a young person who's been in a coma for a long time. You're thinking of taking them off the respirator and letting them die naturally, but you need to know if they're brain dead. And so these are some tests you can do. One would be just the uh, old uh, EEG or the brainwave test where you put monitoring uh, electrodes on the, around the uh, skull and look for brain waves, brain activity. You can do a nuclear medicine brain scan, which is really looking to see if there's any blood flow to the brain. And if there is no blood flow, obviously the patient is uh, brain dead. The apnea test, apnea means without breathing or without breath. So with the apnea test, this would be somebody on a ventilator. You stop the ventilator, and then through both observation and also through measuring oxygen and carbon dioxide, you determine whether they're able to breathe on their own. And another one would be an auditory brainstem response. What this does is you put a little device in the patient's ear. It sends out a series of clicks. Now, the patient's in a coma, so they're not going to be able to tell you if they hear anything. However, 
using monitoring electrodes, you can tell if the brainstem is receiving a signal, which is what you see on the left. You would see this electrical activity uh, in the brainstem as a result of that little clicking sound. On the right, there is no activity in response to the clicking sound, which would indicate brain death. And there are a few other tests you can do as well, but again, these are uh, rarely necessary. And if all else fails, you can always go back to the tried and true method. The only problem here is you have to have somebody sitting there who's uh, listening for the bell. All right. Now, let's talk about completing the death certificate. First of all, nowadays, most states, not all, but most states use the electronic death registration system. Most of my career, we used a paper uh, death certificate. Now, in Massachusetts, around 2014 is when we switched from the paper uh, record over to the electronic uh, system. But regardless of whether they use paper or the electronic system, all states collect basically the same information. Uh, here's a copy, a copy of the old paper form that we used in Massachusetts. And if you looked at each state, whether it's electronic or paper, it's basically the same information that they are asking, maybe with some very minor variations. So uh, also, before we get into what goes on to the death certificate, let's talk about pronouncing versus uh, certifying, okay? So the person who pronounces someone, whether it's a physician or a PA or a nurse practitioner, determines that the patient is dead and determines the time of death, which might be the time that they see them, or it could be the nurse says that uh, the person was found unresponsive uh, say 20 minutes prior to that, and that may be the, used as the cause of death. But in any case, this person determines that the patient is legally dead, but doesn't necessarily certify that the patient is dead by filling out the death certificate with the cause of death and so forth. Now, the attending physician, the person who is in charge of the patient's care, is the one that is responsible for certifying the death by completely filling out the uh, death certificate. Now, how would this work? Uh, as far as uh, the pronouncing versus certifying physician, who may be the same person, but let's say that you are admitted or someone is admitted to a certain physician and it's an expected death at 2 a.m., but that physician is home in bed. The physician who's in charge of that patient will be called, but may call some, a physician who's already in the hospital, an emergency physician, a hospitalist, and say, hey, listen, can you do me a favor? Uh, Mr. Jones just expired down in room 312. Would you mind just pronouncing him and I'll take care of uh, everything else in the morning? And you say, sure, it only takes a few minutes. You go down, you pronounce him. Uh, you write a little note in the chart certifying that the patient is legally dead and the time of death. And then uh, the attending physician, the one to whom the patient is admitted, comes in in the morning and completes the death certificate. Now, in other cases, the medical examiner, or in some states, the coroner, uh, will investigate certain types of death, and basically that would be the person who ends up uh, certifying the death by filling out the death certificate. <clears throat> now, in the emergency department, every single death goes to the medical examiner. We are, at least we call the medical examiner on every death. That doesn't mean that they always accept the patient, and in fact, most of the time, they don't. But if it's any sign of foul play, if you have any concern about homicide or suicide, um, if there's any concern about abuse such as uh, child abuse, um, spousal abuse, elderly abuse, uh, if it's an accident, trauma, uh, or if it's a young person with an unexpected death, let's say it's a 45 year old who suddenly collapses and has a heart attack but has no history of heart disease, even that case the medical examiner will accept and of course any death in a child uh, they will accept. But the vast majority of cases, uh, at least in the emergency department, are, do not meet those criteria and um, are not accepted by the medical examiner. All right, now let's get to the death certificate itself. The death certificate has two basic sections. There's the demographic section, and that's filled out by the hospital admissions clerk, or let's say it's the case of a, a private uh, physician and their patient died at home. It could be the uh, clerk in their front office who registers patients uh, will fill out this section. And then the funeral home also uh, fills out part of the demographic section. And then the second section is the medical information section. This is the part that's filled out by the physician or by the PA or the uh, NP, the nurse practitioner. 
Um, it could be the patient's uh, primary care physician or the attending physician in the hospital, the emergency physician, or as I mentioned before, it could be the medical examiner or the coroner if there's any, um, if they meet certain criteria such as uh, suspicion of foul play and so forth. All right, so the basic demographics is essentially the patient's name, their address, their date of birth, uh, ethnicity, occupation, etc. A lot of this is just collected for statistics, which is sometimes used in studies and so forth, but uh, every, all states collect this uh, basic information. And then uh, the funeral uh, home also needs to fill out a section, essentially uh, the name of the funeral home, their license, but also the disposition of the remains. Will there be a cremation? Uh, when and where will the patient be interred? Uh, that type of uh, thing. Now, the medical information, again, is the physician's responsibility. And believe me, physicians are not very good at paperwork, so this is where a lot of the uh, problems uh, end up uh, occurring. But the medical information part, uh, there's really, there's two parts, part one and part two. Part one records the immediate cause of death and then the sequences, uh, the events that led up to that cause of death. And we'll give some examples of that. Um, now, uh, what you do is you list the immediate cause of death first and then each condition that is listed under that needs to be something that led to the condition above it. Also. Uh, they're very fussy. Um, I, with some of this with the electronic system, it gets taken care of, but uh, certainly with the old paper system, one of the things you had to be very careful of is you can only put one condition on each line and no abbreviations. Otherwise, the death certificate gets uh, rejected, and then as a funeral uh, director, uh, you have to deal with the, uh, with the issue even though you didn't cause it. All right, so here's an example. All right, the immediate cause of death is acute myocardial infarction, which means a heart attack, right? And you want to give an approximate interval. This doesn't have to be exact. It's okay to estimate and you just round it off. But let's say the symptoms start at approximately two hours uh, before uh, the patient uh, expired. So the acute myocardial infarction or the heart attack was due to arteriosclerosis or hardening of the arteries, which has been there for many years. We don't really know exactly how long, but we know it's been going on for a long time. And the arteriosclerosis was at least in part caused by hypertension or high blood pressure, which we know the patient had for 30 years because that's approximately when it was diagnosed and they've been on some uh, treatment for it uh, during that period of time. So you can see that each event leads to the condition above it uh, leading to the final cause of death or the uh, heart attack. Another example, a little simpler, is pneumonia. The patient started with cough and fever three days ago and in spite of treatment expired. Uh, now, a contributing factor is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, also known as COPD, but remember we can't use abbreviations. So you spell out chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, which is essentially a combination of emphysema and chronic bronchitis, uh, and the usually caused by smoking, not always, but almost always. And the patient has had that for 35 years. Now, how did that contribute? The pneumonia was the immediate cause of death, but let's say that one of us had the exact same pneumonia. We most likely would have survived it with some antibiotic treatment. However, this patient with severely damaged lungs uh, from lifelong smoking and the COPD was not able to fight off the infection so that the COPD contributed to the uh, death by pneumonia. All right, so causes of death, it's not an exact science. Medicine in general is not an exact science. So if you have two different physicians who were to fill out uh, the death certificate on the same person and then compare them, you might, uh, in some cases, you may find that each of them chooses a different cause of death, especially in a complex case. There is some judgment involved here. It's not always uh, clear. Uh, the other thing is, especially as you get into older uh, patients, the death can occur from the combined effect of two different things. In other words, uh, organ failure of two different systems. Well, which one really caused the death? Was it the liver failure or was it the kidney failure? It was really a combination of the two, but you essentially have to pick one. Um, but you should, 
in any case, try to make the cause of death as specific as possible. In other words, sepsis. Sepsis is an overwhelming infection where you have an infection somewhere and it gets into the bloodstream and takes over the body and is often fatal. But you don't really want to use sepsis as the cause of death because it's not specific. Where did the sepsis come from? Now you can say sepsis secondary to pneumonia, which then got into the bloodstream, or sepsis secondary to pyelonephritis, which is a kidney infection. That's acceptable because it's more specific. Now the other thing is I already mentioned organ system failure. Uh, you, um, if someone has organ failure, let's say liver failure or kidney failure, one of the things you always want to do is to list the cause of the failure uh, b beneath it. So if someone died of kidney failure, renal failure, which is kidney failure, then you would list type 1 diabetes mellitus, which the patient has had since they were a child, which led to the kidney damage and therefore the kidney failure. Or perhaps someone died of liver failure, hepatic failure or liver failure, and it was due to alcoholic cirrhosis uh, for many years. The other thing is if someone has a fatal injury, it's not enough to just say gunshot wound or stab wound. You need to be a little more specific. Could be gunshot wound to the heart or in this example, a severed femoral artery from a knife wound or a stab wound to the groin. All right. Um, now, if you look at general guidelines from the CDC for the entire country, it will say that it's acceptable in some cases when you're not sure of the cause of death, and we'll talk a little more about that later, but it's okay to use words like possible, you know, like possible heart attack or probable something. Uh, or in some cases, you can even say unknown cause of death. Uh, honestly, in Massachusetts, I've never seen that as being acceptable. Uh, it's ex very uh, strongly frowned upon and uh, may even cause the uh, death certificate to be rejected. But at least theoretically, uh, you may see something like that on a death certificate. All right, now that was part one. So part one was the immediate cause of death, followed by uh, conditions leading to that immediate cause of death. But the patient may have other uh, conditions. Could be chronic alcohol abuse, uh, you know, chronic smoking, uh, recent pregnancy that may have contributed uh, in some way or some injury or past surgery. So this is where you, this is almost, the part two is almost like the junk drawer where any other, other conditions that the patient had that you feel are worth mentioning but didn't really fit into part one you throw into part two. And here you can put as many diagnoses as you want in any uh, order. It really doesn't matter. So in this case, long-term smoker and diabetes mellitus, that actually applies to both of the examples that we already gave. Smoking uh, leads to heart disease and of course leads to a heart attack and diabetes also leads to heart disease. Um, smoking leads to COPD and makes someone more prone to pneumonia. But diabetes, although it may not lead to the pneumonia, it affects your immune system and makes it harder for you to fight off the infection. So these at least indirectly uh, contributed to the cause of death and are worth uh, mentioning. Now there's more to part two. In addition to uh, that section, they also want to know, was the medical examiner notified and was the case accepted? Well, <clears throat> again, I mentioned in the emergency department that we refer every case to the, to the uh, medical examiner. In the hospital, it's only certain cases, like if, if it's an unexpected death or a complication of surgery or something of that nature. But in any case, uh, when we notify the medical examiner, most of the time they um, reject the case or deny the case and we end up filling out the death certificate. But if they do accept the case, then they are the ones who fill out the death certificate after they do their examination. So uh, if I'm filling out a death certificate, the answer is always no, that it was not accepted by the medical examiner because otherwise I wouldn't be filling it out. And the same thing was an autopsy performed. Well, whether it was performed by the medical examiner or whether it was a private autopsy done in the hospital by the hospital's pathologist, most of the time at the um, request of the family, in either case, it's the person doing the autopsy uh, who's going to be filling out the death certificate uh, after they uh, complete their exam. It also wants to know the manner of death, whether it was natural, a heart attack or, or whatever, or was it some kind of accident or trauma, homicide, suicide. And again, unless it was natural, most likely it's going to be the medical examiner who was taking the case and filling out the death certificate. Also, if there is an injury, 
They want more specifics. Where did the injury occur? When did it occur? Was it at work or at home or just out on the street? Um, and how did it occur? And of course, the date and time of death. And then uh, the physician or the PA or the NP who is signing needs to supply their name, address, and their license number. All right. So that's the information that we need to supply on the uh, death certificate. Now let's talk a little bit about inaccuracies. And I've seen widely varying estimates on this. And uh, I've seen 30 to 50% of death certificates contain inaccurate information. I've even seen estimates of up to 80% in certain locales. Um, I think one of the things I want to just mention here is, um, you know, you're in college now. One of the things you want to learn in college is how to think critically, how to read critically. What do I mean by that? What I mean by that is don't just accept anything at face value. Always know the source. So I'm giving you this uh, statistic. What you would want to know is where did I get that? Did I get it from a reliable source? You know, the CDC or NIH, National Institutes for Health, are generally reliable sources. Certain journals are considered uh, very reliable sources, etc. But even if it came from a reliable source, don't just accept it at face value. There may be some inaccuracies. The other thing is, what does it mean? It says 30 to 50% contain inaccurate information. Well, is all of that important uh, or is a lot of it uh, minor? Uh, so you really want to, you want to break it down and find out a little bit more uh, detail and just take all statistics with a grain of salt because most statistics, there's some uh, built-in uh, error. It doesn't mean that they're not valid, but don't take anything just at face value exactly uh, as it's presented. Always do a little more uh, investigation and, and think about things a little bit more. All right, so what are the causes of inaccuracies? Well, lack of training. Well, I was in medical school almost 45 years ago, and you know I received really no training uh, like anyone else, and I don't think it's changed today as far as I can tell. Basically, you're a resident or, or even a medical student. You're a medical student on a service in the hospital with residents. Someone dies. The resident says, uh, here, it's time you learned how to fill out a death certificate. Uh, they might give you a 30-second blurb on it. You fill it out, show it to them, and they say, oh, yeah, this looks good. Or maybe they make a little change or two, and uh, off you go. And that's how you learn how to fill out a death certificate. There really should be a little bit more uh, training on it, uh, to be honest with you. There's more intricacies. Uh, to it than that, but that's what most people get. So it's kind of on the job training. Also, uh, the inaccuracies are, are attributed to some lack of experience. In other words, a lot of times in an academic hospital, certainly it's going to be a resident, uh, someone in training right out of medical school who's filling out the death certificate and they haven't had that much uh, experience yet. Unwitnessed death. This is a big one for the emergency department. Let's say you have an 80 year old um, heart and lung disease, but he's been feeling okay lately. Uh, no complaints. Uh, he goes down to take his uh, afternoon nap. Three hours later, a family member goes to wake him up for supper, and he's unresponsive. They call uh, 911. The paramedics get there. They find that he is flatlined. Basically, he's clinically dead, but they do what they can, uh, start CPR, intubate him, and so forth, bring him to the hospital, where we also find that he is still in flatline and pronounce him dead. What did he die of? Okay, your guess is as good of, as mine. He had a history of heart disease. It could have been a heart attack. It could have also been something we call a primary arrhythmia. That means his heart just went into a fatal rhythm, you know, like a VTAC or a VFib or whatever, without an actual heart attack occurring. It could have been a pulmonary embolism. Maybe he had a clot down in his leg that traveled up to his lung and he never really knew. He didn't tell anyone that he's had a sore leg uh, the last few days. Um, could have been that he had a stroke, a massive stroke, could have been a bleed in his head. Maybe he ruptured an aneurysm. Maybe uh, he had an aneurysm of his aorta in the abdomen, the large blood vessel in the abdomen, and it ruptured. When did he die? Did he die 15 minutes after he went down to take his nap? Or did he die 10 minutes before the uh, family member went to uh, find him? Who knows? All unknown, and there is no way that we're going to have a specific answer without an autopsy. And even with an autopsy, we may not get a specific answer. If it was a primary arrhythmia, in other words, if his heart was irritable, just went into this fatal rhythm without a heart attack, that's not going to show up on an autopsy. The only way you would know that would be if you had a cardiac monitor on him at the time that it happened. We get a lot of this. 
uh, either an unwitnessed death, or in some cases somebody may collapse, it may actually be witnessed, but the cause is unknown because they come in with no heartbeat and we really have no way of knowing what happened, uh, like I said, without an autopsy or sometimes even uh, with an autopsy. So this is one of the sources of inaccuracy on the death certificate, but in some ways it's unavoidable. Now, let's say he's been complaining of chest pain for the past several days um, and had some indigestion before he went to bed. Well, I might reasonably, uh, with his history, feel that this was uh, convincingly a heart attack and put it down as a heart attack or myocardial infarction. But if we don't have some kind of a story like that, we may just put down cardiorespiratory arrest, even though that is discouraged. And it's really just another way of saying unknown, but sometimes we just don't have any choice and that's what you're stuck with. All right, um, now in the, in, uh, the reading that I did, it, it, remember I mentioned that uh, 30 to 50% errors, well, most of those are technical errors. Things like a name might be uh, misspelled. Now, I would think that that has probably gotten better now that we use an electronic uh, record, I actually tried to see if I could find anything on that and I didn't find any data on it. But when someone is registered in the hospital now, they, they tend to be very, very careful about getting the name and address and all that uh, information correct. And it's just a matter now of the electronic um, death certificate pulling that information directly from the medical uh, record of the hospital. So there's less chance for error than uh, in the uh, old days. Uh, when someone would sit there at an old-fashioned typewriter and type the information, and it would be much easier to, uh, to make that type of an error. But still, uh, it, it can still uh, certainly happen. The other thing is I already mentioned, you can't use abbreviations, uh, but people still do it on occasion, and that would cause the uh, death certificate to be rejected. The, the last ones here are really more of an issue with paper records, but they are still around, so I, I left them in there. One would be you can't erase something. Or, or alter it. If you make a mistake, you basically just have to get a, go get a new blank form and start all over again. The other thing is the, when uh, we were using the blank form or the uh, paper form in Massachusetts, the, by far the most common reason for death certificates to get rejected was that someone used blue ink instead of black ink, or they used uh, military time, which we use all in the hospital. Uh, instead of 12-hour time, which was required by the state. And what would happen is these uh, death certificates would then go through, get to the funeral home, who would then have to reject it, redo it, and bring it back to get signed again. So we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, later. Another source of error is listing the mechanism of death as the cause of death. Well, what do we mean by that? Well, <clears throat> when someone dies, they, before they die, they always go into shock, okay? Shock is basically just for your heart, for whatever reason, and there's a lot of different reasons, but for whatever reason, your heart is not able to pump enough blood, oxygenated blood around, to keep the tissues and the organs functioning and alive. Uh, and cardiorespiratory arrest is basically where your heart and your lungs stop working, right? Well, this happens to everyone who dies, but this is the mechanism of death. This is how you die, it's not why you die. The cause of death wants to know why you died. In other words, why did you go into shock and why did you go into cardiorespiratory arrest? Now, since I mentioned shock, I will just mention though that uh, you can be a little bit more specific. Anaphylactic shock is shock from an allergic reaction, severe allergic reaction, such as a bee sting or perhaps a peanut allergy. Cardiogenic shock is basically, we also call it pump failure. It's where your heart is so weakened and so damaged that it's not able to adequately uh, pump uh, blood. So those are more specific types of shock. So something like that would be acceptable, but just the general term shock is not because it's not specific enough. All right, and just mention uh, with the elderly, uh, the elderly can be difficult because they often have many, many diseases. If someone is 50 years old, pretty uh, healthy, but then they suddenly collapse or found to have a heart attack. It's usually just the very one, you know, the one clear cause of death. Whereas with the elderly, they often have so many different things going on, lung disease, heart disease, uh, stroke, whatever, that it can sometimes be a little bit uh, difficult, but you want to be as clear and concise uh, or precise as uh, possible. And now it's not acceptable to just say that someone died of old age, even if they're 110 when they die. But if you go back 100 years or so, 
that actually appears, old age actually appears as one of the 10 most common causes of death. But that was then, this is now, it's no longer uh, acceptable. You have to be uh, more specific. Also, when there, I already kind of alluded that sometimes there's multiple things going on, and sometimes it's not entirely clear which of those is the one that, that specifically causes death, but you just have to do the best you can and uh, try to pick one. And again, this is where some of the uh, variation may come in if you had two different physicians uh, filling out the same death certificate. One of them might choose one condition and one might choose the other. doesn't mean that one is right and one is wrong. They're probably both uh, you know, equally right. It's just a matter of, uh, of judgment. Um, you can also mention multiple system failure. When an organ fails, such as let's say you have liver failure, it is very often accompanied by failure of other organs, in this case, the kidney. Liver failure and kidney failure go together all the time. There's even a term for it, hepatorenal syndrome, you know, uh, liver kidney uh, syndrome. So which one actually caused the death? Not always clear, but the point is, is you can put multi-system failure, it could be two, three, four different systems uh, in part two, but you should specify which of those systems uh, is, are the ones that were failing. All right, an infant's kind of similar. Uh, you want to be very clear, um, you know, sudden infant death syndrome uh, is an acceptable uh, cause of death, even though the cause of it is unknown, but you, you do want to try to be as specific as you can, and it can be somewhat difficult in infants uh, as it is in adults. Now, if it's, if it's related to prematurity, you need to uh, be a little bit more specific than that. In other words, highland membrane diseases, lung disease, that occurs when lungs are immature. So you do see it in, uh, in premature uh, infants. Um, their lung is lacking something called surfactant, makes it difficult for them to breathe and it can be fatal. So you can't just say, say uh, prematurity. What you wanna say is highland membrane disease due to prematurity of 28 weeks. Now, why was the patient premature? Well, that was from placental abruption. That's where the placenta tears away from the inner wall of the uterus causing bleeding both uh, inside and outside the uh, placenta. And that can lead to premature birth. Uh, and why, what caused the uh, placental abruption? Well, it was blunt trauma to the mother's abdomen. It could be a car accident where the mother wasn't wearing a seatbelt and hit against the uh, dashboard or, or something uh, of that nature. All right, let me just give a few more examples. <clears throat> Uh, this one comes from NIH, all right? So the immediate cause of death is uh, sepsis. Now, again, I said sepsis itself is not uh, really uh, a good cause of death, except that here we're going to get a little more specific, okay? So we're gonna say that the patient went into sepsis 24 hours ago. In other words, they dropped their blood pressure and so forth, kind of went into a, a shock uh, from the sepsis 24 hours ago but they've had this necrotizing pneumonia. That means a pneumonia that's kind of eating away at the lung tissue for the past five days. Well, why did they have this very, very aggressive pneumonia? Well, two years ago, they developed an empyema. An empyema is a pocket of pus in the lungs. And usually you can't get rid of it. It just kind of sits there, it gets walled off, and it just kind of sits there, and most of the time just minds its own business but it can you know, sometimes cause some issues. So what happened is the person has had this empyema for two years, but it probably leaked into the uh, rest of the lung and caused this necrotizing uh, pneumonia. Now what caused the empyema? It was a knife wound to the chest around the same time, probably a dirty knife wound, uh, which then caused this infection, which got sealed off and uh, they couldn't get rid of. Now, part two, the person also had type 2 diabetes, which weakens the immune system and made it more difficult for them to fight off uh, this pneumonia. All right, a couple more examples. Uh, here we're talking about, uh, again, uh, septic uh, shock. Um, but what, in this case, it came from infected decubitus ulcers. That's pressure sores. Like you might see someone who is immobilized, perhaps in a nursing home, uh, and they develop these pressure sores, which can then get infected. Well, why did the person uh, develop the pressure sores? Well, it's complications of a cerebral infarction, which is a stroke. So now they're immobilized. They can't move around that well, maybe didn't get turned enough, and they developed these pressure sores, which led to the septic shock. And then uh, why did they get the stroke? Well, that was from cerebral artery atherosclerosis, or in other words, hardening of the arteries in the uh, arteries that, that uh, supply blood to the brain. 
causing the stroke, causing the ulcers, causing the septic shock. And also, once again, and you see this a lot, is the patient had uh, diabetes, which um, also made, them, uh, made it more difficult to clear up the infection uh, leading to the septic shock. And uh, another uh, example here, in this case, the patient died of pneumonia, secondary to malnutrition, probably just very, very weakened state, and they weren't able to clear their, their lungs of bacteria and ended up getting a pneumonia. But why did they have uh, the malnutrition? So in this case, some information is missing. You know, you need to, uh, it could be a lot of different things. I mean, it could be an eating disorder. It could be from uh, cancer of the, uh, of the bowels uh, where they're not able to eat well. There could be a lot of reasons for the malnutrition, but you need to supply that information as to why they uh, develop the malnutrition. Otherwise, it's incomplete. And uh, the last example here, <clears throat> in this case, it's a 68-year-old man who uh, developed a liver cancer, a patocellular carcinoma is liver cancer, right? And was started on chemotherapy. Now, three months later, he got admitted for both a uh, essentially liver failure. His liver was uh, uh, failing. Uh, the function was decreasing. But he also developed a blood clot in his left thigh. Okay, now as long as the blood clot stays in his left thigh, it's not doing any uh, serious harm. But he gets admitted to the hospital being treated for the liver failure and also uh, being treated on uh, anticoagulants or blood thinners, uh, if you prefer, uh, for the um, blood clot in the thigh. However, three days later, the blood clot breaks off from uh, its place in his thigh, travels to his lung, causes a pulmonary embolism, and he dies uh, 30 minutes later. All right, so what's the immediate cause of death? I mean, he has liver cancer. Did he die of cancer? No. What he died of was the pulmonary embolism. That was the immediate cause of death. And the reason that he got the pulmonary embolism is because he developed the thrombosis or the blood clot in his left thigh. Why did he develop the thrombosis in his left thigh? Well, at least in part, it was due to his liver failure, which immobilized him. He probably wasn't able to move around very much and <clears throat> probably uh, sluggish blood flow, etc., leading to the blood clot, which led to the pulmonary embolism. And why did he have uh, the liver failure? Well, it's from the liver cancer. So I think you get the picture uh, at this point. All righty. <clears throat> now we're done with the technical uh, aspects of filling out the uh, death certificate. Um, but there are other issues. And let's say a death certificate is not filled out properly or maybe is not filled out at all. Well, you're not the one who caused the problem, but as a funeral director, you're the one who gets to deal with it, okay? Uh, because now you have to chase down the physician and get them to uh, do their part. And physicians hate paperwork and uh, it's not always uh, an easy thing, but there are some little I think tricks that you can uh, do to uh, make this a little bit of an easier uh, process, but unfortunately you are the one who is stuck with this. Now, um, for much of my career, I was the medical director of my group, so I know a little something about managing physicians. It is not easy. Physicians are very independent. They don't like to be told what to do, and they absolutely hate uh, paperwork, and they don't want to be told that they have to fix something uh, on a form. Uh, in fact, dealing with physicians is very much like herding cats. Even if you're a physician, it's difficult uh, to deal with them. So uh, <clears throat> I do realize that this is not easy. Now, don't get me wrong. Most physicians are very nice people. Uh, if you had a physician as a neighbor, you'd probably get along great with them. You would find that they were very uh, laid back and down to earth and friendly. But you're dealing with them when they're at work and you don't really know them on a social basis, so it's a whole different uh, situation. You know, they're extremely busy. They're getting pulled in 10 different directions at once. They're an hour behind. Uh, and this, you know, when you come in and want them to sign the death certificate, it's just a nuisance. It's one more interruption uh, of many, many, many interruptions that they're getting throughout the day. Now, I'm not um, saying this as an excuse because it is their responsibility to fill out the death certificate. They need to do it. So I'm not excusing them. They need to take care of this. I'm just kind of giving more of a explanation 
uh, as to why it may not always be easy. So when you do come in to approach the physician, uh, you may get this, but what you really want to do is turn this into this. How do you do it? Well, <laughs> there's, no, there's no magic to it, but this is something that I've tried to go by my whole life. Okay? If you want someone to do something for you, make it as easy as possible for them to do it. It not only helps them, but it actually helps you as well. And this is not just uh, in this situation with the death certificate. This is uh, with everyone. Let's say I have someone coming by to uh, clean my furnace tomorrow, service my furnace. I'm going to go down tonight and I'm going to move anything that is anywhere near the furnace, I'm going to move it out of the way so that when the technician comes in tomorrow, he's going to have a nice clear area to work in. It's going to make it easier for him to do the good job that I want him to do. It's going to make his day nicer, but it's also going to make things better for me as well. And, uh, you know, the other thing is with the death certificate, it's not just the physician you're dealing with. You're going to be dealing with their front office, with the registration clerk, with the nurses. You're going to be dealing with town hall, with the clerks in town hall. You're going to be dealing with colleagues in other, nursing, in other uh, funeral homes. Excuse me. And you want to apply this uh, throughout. It really does make your life uh, much easier and uh, makes it easier for you to get things uh, done. So how does this apply? Well, let's say you need to have a physician uh, let's, let's say you have a um, death certificate with an error on it, or in some cases you just don't have one at all. Uh, before you go to the physician, make sure that you have everything filled out on it that you possibly can, so that all the physician really needs to do is just sign it and they're done. Uh, try to make it convenient for them, okay? Whether you're dropping it off at their office and you'll pick it up at the end of the day, whether you're going to meet them at a nursing home or meet them in the hospital. If you're going to meet them in a nursing home, find out when they're uh, going to be there and perhaps get there uh, five or ten minutes before they do so that you can catch them as they're coming in the door before they get really busy uh, you know, with their patients and now you're interrupting them in the middle of uh, writing up a chart or uh, whatever. Uh, so just in any case, just try to make it as easy uh, for them as you possibly can. Okay, uh, That goes a long way. The other thing is just uh, be pleasant, be courteous, be professional, empathetic. In other words, what do I mean by empathetic? You know, you see the physician say, listen, I'm really sorry to bother you with this, but, you know, I know you're busy, but uh, I just need this uh, signed, okay? So show a little sympathy for their uh, busy day, even though you're also having a very busy day and your day is being interrupted, but show that little empathy and do the same thing for the town clerk, okay, or for the nurse in the office, uh, etc. Be professional, too. Look and act the part. Well, I used to tell the younger physicians, when you go into the emergency department, you are on stage. And this is true of the nurses and everyone else. You're on stage. Everyone is watching you all day long, even if you don't think they are. So you need to look and act the part at all times. And that goes the same for you. Look and act uh, professional. And again, just be pleasant and uh, courteous. The other thing is, you know, it may not always be possible. But in some cases, you can develop a little bit of a personal relationship with people. Okay, let's say the town clerk. You notice that she has a picture of uh, a uh, teenager on the uh, desk and, and he's wearing a uh, uniform of an Eagle Scout. And you say, oh, is that your son who's an Eagle Scout? That's a great accomplishment. And just stop there. You don't want to get into a long conversation, uh, you know, especially where you're doing most of the talking. But you just stop there and give them an opening. And she may say, oh, yeah, I'm so proud of him. Uh, his father was an Eagle Scout, etc." Next time you come in, <clears throat> she's going to remember that, okay? Uh, you can even do that with physicians, probably to a lesser extent, but um, let's say as an emergency physician, we had to get physicians, primary care physicians, surgeons, specialists, to do things that they didn't necessarily want to do. Now, if they were on call, they basically just had to do it. If I said, hey, you have to come in and take care of this patient, they didn't have any choice. But sometimes they were doing us a favor. Let's say that I had a patient who needed to see a specialist and was extremely anxious, and it wasn't that urgent, but I know if they call the office, they're going to get an appointment in two or three weeks. I might call the specialist and say, hey, listen, can you do me a favor? I have this patient here, very, very anxious. Can you get him in uh, anytime soon? He say, sure, I'll put him in at the end of the day tomorrow. Now, I get off the phone, and this has happened to me a number of times. I would have a younger physician say to me, how did you get him to do that for you? I asked him something similar a week ago and he said no. Well, how did I? 
Well, in some cases, I might have golfed with him last week. But more likely, I saw him in the cafeteria yesterday, and I said, hey, I see you were on vacation last week. Did you go anyplace interesting? And he tells me, oh, yeah, we went to Disney. We had a great time with the kids. Or I went out west hiking. I love hiking out west. Or I went scuba diving. I say, oh, I'm a scuba diver as well. Uh, and we start uh, making uh, notes. And then, and it's funny when you, when you uh, something like that uh, starts getting around, too. I mean, I might mention to another physician that I'm a scuba diver. Next thing I know, someone's stopping me in the hall, one of the cardiologists, and saying, oh, I hear you scuba dive. I do as well. So this is how you develop the personal relationship with people so that when you call them and ask them for a favor, you're not just somebody that they only talk to when there's a problem. You're someone who's a colleague and a friend, someone they have something in common with, and they're much more likely to, uh, do, to do you that favor. Now, how does that apply to you? Well, because you're thinking, yeah, right, I can do that with a physician. Well, no, I mean, I'm not naive. I know you can't do it exactly the same way that I did, but here's what you could do. Um, let's say you're a car guy and you see the physician drive up to the nursing, uh, nursing home. He's driving this really nice, uh, I don't know, fancy sports car or whatever. And, you know, comes in and say, wow, great car. Just leave it at that. That's all you say. Now, the response you might get is, oh, yeah, thanks. Okay. Where do I sign? Uh, but you also might get, oh, I love this car. I got it about six months ago. I've been wanting to get it for years uh, and so on. And next time you come in, he may not remember your name, but he remembers, oh, you're the car guy. And he's more likely to be pleasant and say, hey, where do I sign? Uh, let me take care of this for you. Okay, things like that. Uh, it does work. Now, some of you, the cynical ones, are saying, oh, he's telling me to brown nose everybody. <laughs> no, that's not what I'm saying. You have to be sincere, okay? That is, you have to actually enjoy interacting with people. Uh, otherwise, you just come across as phony. But just, you know, and be yourself. Don't try to do things the way that I would do it or the way somebody else would do it. Do it your way, but just be pleasant, be sincere, maybe make a little personal connection with people, and believe me, it will go a long way toward making your life more pleasant. If you follow those suggestions, hopefully this is the reception you will get rather than the opposite. Well, my little friend here tells us that our time is up. If you have any questions, I would be happy to try to answer them. Just forward them to your professor and they'll find their way to me and I'll uh, do the best I can. Uh, hope you enjoyed this. I hope it was helpful. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for listening to this episode of Mortuary Mayhem. For links to information discussed during this episode, please visit the website at www.mortuarymayhem.com. Do you have questions, comments, suggestions for topics, or want to be a guest on the show? Email us at podcast at mortuarymayhem.com. We should do this again sometime.